Hey, good morning. Welcome back. Any questions before we start? This is the penultimate week, right? So we're going to go a little fast today. I have a few topics to cover still. Uh, but, you know, feel free to stop me if something is not entirely clear to you. All right? So uh, let's get started with just a wrap-up of expectation maximization. If you remember, we did that in last class. Right, and uh, I am st I have still not uploaded the video for Friday. I had some audio issues, so I'll, I'll figure that out, and then we'll put it there. Oh, it's me. All right. So expectation maximization, right? So we have looked at it, right? We have looked at it as a general algorithm, and we have also looked at how to use it for estimating parameters of a mixture model. And in general, what I said was that whenever your data has missing data or uh, uh, latent variables, hidden variables, then expectation maximization is a, is a nice way to maximize your likelihood or posterior, log likelihood or log posterior, because it allows for this sort of two-step two strategy instead of trying to maximize. Uh, I mean, you can maximize the log posterior or log likelihood just like that, right? But as we, sh uh, as we saw last time was that that function will have multiple peaks. So there will be the issue of local maxima. And um, expectation maximization lets you sort of travel those, those peaks in a slightly better way, right? It's still not guaranteed that it will always reach the, the global optimal solution. It might also get stuck in the local minima, but uh, it tries to do it in a slightly better way, all right? Okay, so let me stop with sort of a demonstration and then we can move to the next topic, right? So we have looked at, oops, we have looked at this work or notebook where I have used EM to, uh, or actually I have a working code for EM, right? So you can look at it. All it does if you look at this code is that it does this loop, right? In each loop, it does the E step. Right? And for mixture models, you remember that the E step is fairly easy. All you need to compute are those RIKs, or in this code, I call them gamma, gamma IKs. So that's the responsibility, right? So probability of ZI to be K given XI and the current estimate for your parameters. That's what we do here, right? We say it is equal to pi times whatever the, the PDF is, right? And then we add it by a normalization parameter, right? So that's uh, E step, and in the M step we saw that because it's such a nice sort of an expression that we have closed form solutions for your new estimates. So we compute mu, sigma, and pi again, and then we keep doing that over and over again until we converge. All right, so that's sort of how EM works, right? And you can try it on this simple data and you'll see that it works. But today what I, I wanna show you quickly is how to use it for not just one dimensional data, but two dimensional data, okay? So there is this very popular data set called Old Faithful. So this goes to, the, to that geyser or geyser in uh, Yellowstone, which sort of called Old Faithful, which erupts every so often, right? So what people have done is they have measured uh, the time elapsed between successive eruptions of that, ge that geyser and also the height of how far it went. And it has been understood that this geyser sort of, that, that distribution, if you look at those two variables, it has two modes, okay? So in fact, we can, so this is where I load the data. <clears throat> and then I, if you look, so this is the whole EM step. So we'll, we'll just run through it and we'll see what happens, right? So, so let's look at each plot one by one, all right? So this is the starting. So this very light points are the data points. So each point is like an eruption of your old faithful. This axis tells you how high it went. This axis, I think, tells you how 
uh, what was the time elapsed between successive eruptions and we have normalized it so that's why they don't quite seem like height and time but I mean uh, the unnormalized data look like that okay so in the beginning what you do is that you assume some some values in the EM algorithm you you initialize your mu's and sigmas right so these circles kind of denote the Gaussians because you're assuming each component. you're assuming there are two components and you're also assuming that each component is a Gaussian with some mean right so this one's mean is right over here and this Gaussian's mean is over here and this width of the circle kind of denotes the variance right so if the variance is high the circle will be higher then what happens is, is that in each iteration of your EM you kind of change your uh, so the first thing you do is you take each point and you say okay what is the probability that it came from this or it came from this right those are your RI case or your gamma I case in this implementation then you use that to re-estimate your mean. So that's what happens here, is that once you assign these RIKs to each point, then you re-estimate your mean and variance, and then the mean and variance looks like this. And this color kind of indicates how much does it like its closest component, right? So if it's dark, it means that it's very close to uh, its component. And then it kind of keeps doing that in loop. So you'll see that over time what will happen is that it will start looking like this so at the end what it has done is that the mean and variance have kind of gone and aligned with the natural mean and variance of these two modes right and then each point has been assigned to one but another thing that you see here is that some points like these ones right these ones are not green or black they are a mi middle color because what happens is this kind of tells you how much does it like this cluster or this mode and how much does it like this mode and that is sort of the power of uh, mixture models is that each point can belong to both with certain probabilities right that's a little different from if you had run k-means on this data then k-means would have also colored them but it would have colored them in exactly two colors all right and then uh, you can also see this in sort of a video I created this video so if you look at this this sort of shows you the same animation but in a more nicer way so if you look at it what happens is that in the beginning it starts with sort of everybody is part of every, both modes and then slowly these things change and at the end of it you see a very nice separation all right any question okay very nice so that kind of concludes our discussion on expectation maximization which is a very interesting algorithm and later on we will see that that algorithm is also useful in other settings like the one that, that we are going to look at today but we are not going to sort of go through how to do EM for this particular model I would uh, I mean if you're interested you can sort of try that on your own okay so today we are going to look at another latent variable model called factor analysis right? so factor analysis is a statistical procedure so if you if you go take a course in statistics you will come across this model but we are going to look at it from the perspective of linear models so they don't quite sort of teach factor analysis in that in that way right but what I want to look at it is in this particular uh, fashion right? so we have looked at mixture models right mixture models are nothing but models in which you assume that your observed data which is your xi right is a random variable but its parameters are governed by a hidden variable zi and zi can take in mixture models zi can take one out of k value right so that's a typical k mode mixture model but what if zi instead of being categorical what if we make this a number or what if we make it a vector of numbers right so so that's the point like what if zi instead of being one through k is a vector of l values all right so the whole process would still work right so what you would do is that you'll say I have a hidden variable zi which is actually a vector of values so I'll first sample it from a probability distribution and let's say we assume that zi is coming from a Gaussian distribution all right with some mean mu zero and some covariance matrix sigma zero that's because we sort of whenever we have a vector of values that's the most sort of uh, uh, you know straightforward assumption that it's coming from a Gaussian but it's not necessary you can apply some other model on that as well 
but here we are going to assume that zi is coming from a distribution with mean mu zero and uh, covariance matrix which is sigma zero. And now, what we assume is that given zi, we have some probability distribution for xi. That's kind of like what we did for mixture models as well, is that we had some xi given zi comma theta. Theta are the parameters of this whole model, so we'll talk about them later. Now, if I want to compute the marginalized probability distribution for xi, it will just be a sort of a integral over all possible zi. So try to compare this with the equation above, right? So here, because zi was taking k value, you just had a summation, but here instead of that, you have a uh, have an integral, right? But other things are the same. So that is sort of how uh, this is an extension of uh, mixture models to a more a more general case, right? So this is what we call a factor factor analysis model. So we assume that xi is a multivariate Gaussian random variable, all right? And zi is also a multivariate Gaussian random variable. xi is observed to us, we can see it, right? zi is hidden. And then there is a way in which xi is connected to zi, and that kind of gives you this new model, all right? So using this, we can now compute, uh, we can now model your xi, right? Just as we did in mixture models, this is very similar, except that you are assuming a different form of zi. So that's how I want you to look at all of these different latent variable models, is that they all start with a general philosophy that you have a hidden variable, right? You have some distribution that generates your hidden variable, and then you have a uh, observed variable, which is a function of your hidden variable, all right? So let's sort of uh, look at it a little more. So whenever you have these kind of models, right, there are two ways to look at them. One is the generative process. So you can think of, okay, how was the data generated? And the second is sort of the reverse process where you say, I have the observations that has already been generated. Now I want to reverse engineer it and see what were the hidden variables or the parameters that generated this, right? So let's first look at the generative process. So the idea is this. You have some probability distribution for zi, okay? And zi, we are assuming, is a vector with L components, right? And we are also assuming that zi is just a normal distribution and with some mean and some covariance matrix. And these, these are parameters that we will learn later. So right now, let's assume that this is given to us. So what we will do is we'll first sample a zi. We'll generate a sample, right? Then what we will do is we compute WZI plus mu. Okay, so these both are also parameters of the model. So I'll explain what these are. But W we are going to assume is a matrix, is a D cross L matrix. Okay, so D is the dimensionality of your observed data, right? and L is the dimensionality of your hidden variable. So, and mu is a vector, is a D cross one vector, okay? So what happens here? So just let's look at this operation over here. What we are doing is we are taking ZI, we are multiplying it with W. So W is a matrix, right? So when we multiply D cross L matrix with the L cross one vector, it will give you a D cross one vector, right? and then we add another d cross one vector to it. So we get a d cross one vector there, right? And then we say that P of xi given zi, right, is a normal distribution. So what we observe given zi is a normal distribution with mean as this value, okay? And we assume that there is some covariance matrix psi. So you can, so psi mu, W, mu naught, sigma naught. They are all parameters of this factor analysis model that we will learn later, all right? But in the generative process, this is how it works. You first sample a zi, then you transform zi into a mean using this operation. And then you 
sample from a new distribution to get your xi okay so what does a weight vector this matrix do right so in factor analysis we call w is also known as a loading matrix and what this does is if you think about it it has d it is d cross l right so w is this is w it has d rows and l columns and then it is getting multiplied with its l cross 1 uh, what is this uh, zi so you are kind of taking linear combinations of this so every row here is getting an inner product with this right so you are taking linear combinations of your hidden variables and producing your xi uh, producing the mean for your xi so that's that's the effect so that's why we call loading matrix so what the way to in, uh, understand factor analysis is these vectors kind of tell you that okay the data actually lies in an l dimensional space in 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 reality your data was in l dimensional space right however what you observe is a transformation of your data and how was it transformed it was transformed by a matrix w and then adding some noise that's given by this okay so that is the idea so you can think of factor analysis model as a way of doing dimensionality reduction so you have some data which was in d dimensional space but what you're assuming is the data actually lies in l dimensional space which is given by your zi's your each zi is an l dimensional vector and in the generative process of course when the data was generated this was how it was generated you took a point in this l dimensional space and then you transformed it and you got xi right now the of course the dimensionality reduction means that you will be given xi's and now you have to come back to your uh, zi's right so that is the idea but what factor analysis also to do is interpret these weights okay so this this loading matrix is very interesting very important in factor analysis in fact the way factor analysis has been proposed is not as much for dimensionality reduction but to try to understand the hidden factors so that's why the name factor analysis right so what they assume is that you're observing and it's it's used lots in uh, you know psychometrics where you take uh, surveys of people right so you 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 take a huge behavioral survey of all students in the class ask them different kinds of questions right so let's say you ask them 200 questions but what you believe is that every student so what you believe is that let's say these questions are about the personality right but what you believe is that personality actually has four or five dimensions to it it's not like you have 200 different aspects of personality but what you ask is not because you you cannot formulate exact questions that will tell you those five aspects of somebody's personality so what you do is you ask a whole lot of questions right and you assume that each aspect this hidden aspect is a combination of some of those questions right so by doing so first you do the questionnaire and you get the answer so you get your axis and then you run factor analysis on it and then you get these hidden factors and each factor hopefully right will correspond to one aspect of the personality so that is the idea but for us in machine learning we are going to look at it more as latent variable model right we don't care well we kind of care but we don't care right now as to what this will be used for but you just need to keep this in mind that it could be either used for uh, you know dimensionality reduction where you get your given xi you get your zi right so uses of right so one use of course is a rich form for pxi given theta right which we said is just p uh, xi given zi comma theta pzi dzi right so it lets you sort of model the probability distribution for xi in a more rich way right otherwise you could have you would have just assumed that pxi given theta is some normal distribution for with some mu and sigma right but that's that does not have any hidden variable so that's one use but we will see 
later that this actually is not very useful. The second use is where you say is uh, you can do dimensionality reduction. Ooh, dimensionality reduction, where you, given some xi, you try to find what is my zi. So that's an inverse problem, right? That way, you can uh, find, for every xi, you can find a lower dimensional representation of that. And the third is what is actually the name, which is factor analysis, where you, where you learn w and interpret it, where you use this w to see, okay, what are these hidden variables? Because what will happen is that when you learn this W, right, this W matrix, you will take each, actually not like this, you'll take each one of these columns, right, and each column is a factor. So there are L factors. You're assuming that the data actually has L hidden factors. Right? So each column here will tell you how much, what, what is the, so if you look at the values here, right, so this will tell you, okay, what does this mean? So maybe in this particular factor, there were only the first two variables which were high and everything else was zero. Let's say that's the case. So then you can do some kind of semantic analysis. You can say, okay, this factor means is sort of these two variables. So then you can assign a semantic uh, notion to each one of your factors. And that's why, that's how factor analysis is really used. Then what you could do is then you can, when you're estimating these things, right, then you can say, okay, for every xi, which factors were activated? So then you can say, okay, this is kind of like this, right? So this zi will tell you, okay, which factors are important for this particular xi? So then you can map data into those, that factor space, all right? Any questions so far? Yes. So the question is, is W different for different ZIs? No, so W is fixed. W is fixed for this model. So we'll learn it, but W is fixed, ZI is different. So uh, the mean for every XI will be different. Because here, there is no I here, right? So W is going to be fixed, and we are going to sort of assume, uh, we are going to learn, we, uh, at least we'll see how to learn it. I, I will not go into the derivation, all right? And what we'll also assume is, We'll make some other simplifications, like we'll assume that mu zero, which is sort of the prior on your zi, is a zero vector, so it's all zeros. We'll assume that sigma zero is identity, because it is, what we'll see later on is that if we assume these are zero and identity, your w, mu, and the psi will change accordingly. So you don't really have to learn this, right? The other thing we'll also assume is that the psi is actually just a diagonal matrix, just for uh, that makes sort of computations more simple and I mean in uh, yeah it doesn't really affect things but in general these need not be that simple okay any other questions does that answer your question or so you can think of zi as a label but zi can take any value right so it's it's a value in the sense it's on the numeric scale. In fact, each zi is a vector, right? So it's not a label as is uh, as we saw in mixture models where zi took value from one through k, but this is going to take any possible value. Let me give you a demonstration that will sort of maybe make it a little clear. So let's look at our factor analysis notebook. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an experiment where, how, where I'll show you how to generate this data, right? So we are going to assume that our L is 1. So our hidden, so there is only one dimension in our hidden factors. So there's only one factor, right? And I'm going to assume that mu 0 is 0, sigma 0 is 1, all right? W I'm going to assume is, a, is 8 comma 1. So now W will be D by L, so D by 1, right? Because there is only, sorry. L by L by D, so 1 by D. So it's going to be just a one-dimensional vector. And here we are assuming that the data that you observe is in two-dimensional space. Your D is 2. So W is 1 by 2, right? Mu is that thing that we add to WXI. I'm assuming that's also 0, 0, right? 
And because these are the things that we will learn from data, but right now I'm trying to show you how it, the data is generated. So I'm assuming that we know these things. And I'm assuming that psi is nothing but a one dimension, a, a diagonal matrix with one, so identity matrix. So how do we generate X, right? So what we do first is that first we generate our Z, right? We generate Z by just taking random samples from mu zero sigma zero. So that's what I've done here. I've generated thousand Z's like that. For every Z, I first compute a mu, a new mu, which is Z times W plus mu, right? Then I generate an X from that. So X, I generate from a multivariate normal distribution in which mu is given by this quantity and psi is psi. And that gives me X. So that's the generative process. So if I look at it, this is how it will look. So what happens is in the process, when I did that loop, right, what I did was I sampled Z's from this line. The Z was one dimensional, right? So I sampled lots of Z's, thousand Z's from a, from a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one. So I would have gotten a lot of uh, zeros here, a lot of Z's from here, some Z's from here and so on, right? So if I look at the empirical distribution of those Z's, it will look like this, right? So I got lots of Z's from here. And then what, what I do is, then I compute my uh, uh, axis. I'm just trying to see what I was. So each point here is actually an X. So what happens is that after I compute my Z, I transform it into a mean. So these are actually the means that I get. I do W, Z plus mu. That gives me a mean. And then I sample from this mean to get an X, right? So this is the X. So this is my X. These are my Zs. From Z to X through this mean, right? So this is the process. And what we are going to do in reality, what we want to do is that given this data, given my x's, how do I estimate the parameters of this z and that w matrix and, and so on, right? So that's the process. But this is a generative process. So we, we first sample z's, then we change it to get a mean vector for my new x, and then I get this. So one interesting thing that you'll see from this plot is that even this looks like a Gaussian, right? even though we didn't quite sample x directly from a Gaussian, but this looks like a Gaussian, right? And that is true, and we'll see, because of the Gaussian properties, right, things get very easy, and... All right. <clears throat> so if you think about this uh, marginal distribution, right, xi given theta, so this will be equal to xi given zi comma theta, times pzi dzi, right? So that's, that's easy to understand, right? So we can replace this, this quantity, by its PDF, right? Because we know that this random variable given zi is a normal distribution with this as mean and this as my covariance matrix. And we know what is a PDF for pzi, that's just this. So if I compute this integral, right? It turns out we can compute this integral because of the form of the PDF of a normal distribution, right? This we have seen in the past as well. It's just so well behaved that it always gives you nice results, right? So you can actually compute this integral, and if you compute this integral, you'll see that the marginal probability of xi is actually a Gaussian with this as my mean and this as my covariance matrix, right? So even though we generated each xi, using a different mean and covariance matrix, right? For every xi, we used zi to give me the mean and covariance matrix. Well, the covariance matrix was fixed, but we, we used a different mean because that mean depend, depended on zi's, right? So we did that, but if I looked at this eventual distribution, which is over here, this one, this will be a Gaussian, which will not depend on zi at all. It will just be Gaussian with this mean and this covariance matrix. So that's. That's sort of the beauty of this whole factor analysis. It's kind of beauty, but it also tells you that it's not really giving you a richer model then, right? So that our first use is gone. So if you remember, 
when I listed out three uses for uh, Gaussian uh, factor analysis model, one thing which I said was that it gives you a rich form for Pxi given theta, which is this. But if you compute it, it turns out that it does not depend on Zi. So it's just like assuming some, I mean, if you had just taken Xi and done MLE on it, it would have given you some mean and covariance matrix. So this part is not very useful, but these parts are still very useful because you're still sort of looking at this hidden latent variable space. All right? Any questions so far? Yes. So the question is, if we pick a different distribution for Z, which means that I would not be able to write this part, right? Uh, so this, if this ZI was, let's say, uh, something else, that's the uh, product of individual beta distribution, this is just for the sake of it, right? Then computing this integral would be hard, right? And so then we might not be able to write it like this. We would still be able to compute it, either doing some numerical integration or some Monte Carlo kind of simulation that we talked about last time, but you would not get this result anymore. So that might actually give you some interesting results. And, you know, I'm sure, so people have sort of tried other variants of this as well. This is the most uh, vanilla form of it. Any other questions? Okay. So moving on. Right. So then, as I said, what, what typically happens in um, practical implementations of factor analysis model is that you set mu 0 to 0, right, and sigma 0 to identity. So you're assuming that your zi's are just getting sampled from a zero mean unit covariance uh, Gaussian. So then if you look at the, this value, right, so this mean and covariance that we computed there, it would have a certain form. So let's try to write it out. So what we saw on the, that particular slide, right, on slide 5, is that P of Xi given theta, when we did the whole integration, looks like a normal distribution with this as the mean and this psi as the covariance matrix. And you might ask me how did we arrive to this. So if you are interested, you can actually solve that integral. It's actually not very difficult because in the integral, everything is an exponent, right? So just use the identity that integral of ex dx is always ex and things would sort of work out. So you can actually uh, derive this, but here we are assuming that we have already arrived at the solution. Right? So this is the general formulation, but if we assume if mu zero is zero, a zero vector, and sigma zero is identity matrix, right? Which means that the mean mean of this posterior of this uh, marginal will be equal to just mu, right? And the covariance matrix will be equal to because i will go away, right? So the point is that you assumed that you're adding some mean, right? So this is this mu is this mu that we add to our wzi, right? So what happens is that the marginal that you get will also have the same mean, all right? So for example, here. Here we are assuming that our marginal, uh, the the mu is the uh, zero zero, right? Which means that this marginal distribution's mean will also be zero zero, right? That's just the point. And and the covariance matrix is given by sigma, uh, sorry, this psi plus w w transpose. Now, what is that? This, right? So how is this useful? So of course, as I said, you could have directly sort of done an MLE on your data and gotten some values, but this still helps you in one way. So how does it help you? Is that this actually needs less memory to store, all right? So if you think about it, so what is this covariance matrix? Right? If we had directly computed this value, if we had directly 
done MLE on the data and gotten some covariance matrix, that would have required D cross D, right? Original matrix is D cross D, right? But if I do it like this, right, then let's look at it. So this psi is actually a D cross D matrix, but it is a diagonal matrix, right? So psi is diagonal implies that psi needs D values, right? And W is actually D cross L, right? D cross L, yeah, D cross L, which means that to represent your covariance matrix, you only need D plus D cross L values instead of D, D squared. So it's not just the notion of uh, memory. So it's not just that it's, it will need less memory, but also that now you want to estimate fewer parameters, right? Earlier, when you were trying to find out the covariance matrix, when you do MLE, right? And if your D is very large, let's say your dimensions are 100. So you're trying to find a 100 cross 100 covariance matrix, right? So what you will see is that you would need more data because you need to estimate 100 cross 100 entries in your covariance matrix. But if you do this factor analysis way of things by assuming that there are fewer factors that actually represent your data, then you would just have to estimate D cross L plus D value. So that's less than that, right? So let's say if your L is 2, then you would estimate 100 times 2 plus 100. So just 300 values instead of 100 cross 100 values. So that's one, even though I said that this rich form for XPXI is not really that rich because it's kind of giving me a Gaussian anyway, right? But it is still useful because you are not really going to estimate that many features, right? Oh, that many entries in your covariance matrix. So the idea is that you can work with less amount of data, right? So if you're doing MLE for a 100-dimensional covariance matrix, right, you will need a lot of data to estimate, reliably estimate the values. But if you just do factor analysis, right, then you need fewer. That's the point, okay? Any questions? All right. So now let's also look at, okay, what else can we use it for? Okay, so this is the point that I was trying to make, that you don't need uh, D, D, D by D entries. Okay, now the other thing, okay, how do we need it? What, what do we need it for, right? So as I said, Px given a theta, okay, okay, that could be used. But we also, what is more useful is to get this lower dimensional representation of x. So given x, I want to factor it down to two or three dimensions. So essentially what you want to compute is PZI given XI comma theta. So the inverse problem, right? So how do we do that? It's easy, right? Because you can apply Bayes rule to this, right? So PZI given XI comma theta will be PXI given ZI comma theta times PZI divided by the integral, right? And that's because all of these things are Gaussian, you can compute them. It turns out that you can actually compute closed form values and it turns out that this PZI given XI comma theta will also be a, a Gaussian. All right? That's the beauty of Gaussian. Gaussians multiplied with Gaussians just give you Gaussian, nothing else. So it gives you a new Gaussian with some mean and some covariance matrix which has these forms. So this is something that you can actually compute or um, derive, right? But I'm not going to look, I'm just giving you the straight result. So this is what you get. So if I have some xi, if you want to get back what the zi is, you just compute these formulas. So for example, in our simple math, uh, example, we had assumed that this is identity, right? So this will just be identity plus this value. And uh, this is, this sigma comes from here. And then we assume that mu zero is also zero. So this value will go away. So in reality, the, the values that you get for zi are fairly easy to compute. All right, any questions so far? So, so far I have not told you how to estimate psi and w and mu and so on, right? That's the part that I'll quickly tell you later on. But right now what I'm showing you is that if I have the factor analysis model, how do I get zi from xi, so this thing? So if I, if I give you this value 
and I say what was the zi that would have generated this you can apply this formula and you will find out that the zi that generated this is a caution by itself with some mean somewhere and some covariance matrix all right which is given by these expressions so that kind of helps you right because that's what we wanted we wanted to get lower dimensional representation of our data all right any questions so far so this is exactly how you use it what you do is that you can embed every xi into a smaller dimensional space and uh, and i'll show you how to sort of well let's jump to a to an application here that will make it a little more clear later on i also want to tell you one more issue with uh, uh, with with factor models this is the issue of unidentifiability so this is let's quickly look at it right so you know what an orthogonal matrix is right uh, an orthogonal matrix is one such that every column if you multiply it with the same column it will give you a uh, unit unit vector or unit value so if you take a dot product with itself it will give you, give you a unit value and if you take a dot product of any vector with any other vector in that matrix it will give you zero so that means that if you do r r transpose it gives an identity matrix so only diagonals are one everything else is zero so let's say you have a matrix like this okay so if i compute instead of doing w if i multiply w with this half of this orthogonal matrix or this orthogonal matrix wr what you will see is that you will get the same solution because everywhere w gets multiplied with w transpose right so if i multiply w with an r then it becomes w r r transpose w transpose and since r r transpose is identity which means that you will get the same answer so the 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 point i'm trying to make is that you can actually learn many w's not just one you can learn many w's which are just so there is some original w and you can learn any w which is original w times some orthogonal matrix and it will give you the same answer so in terms of getting zi you are fine the zi that you will get from this w or an r times w will be the same so that's not going to uh, affect us too much but in terms of interpreting this w now remember i said earlier right you can interpret this w so the interpretation becomes tricky because you will maybe some algorithm will give you one w another algorithm will give you another w and they both are just w and r w but you don't know which one is which right which you, so that is the sort of this issue of unidentifiability so i mean this is kind of an advanced topic so don't worry about it too much but the point is that in many latent variable models you will keep seeing this kind of issue cropping up so if you see that just refer to this discussion uh and that is sort of an issue with many models like this right but here what we are going to assume is that we'll have some magic way of getting the right r or getting getting the right w okay quickly let me also talk about how to estimate the parameters so remember there were actually five parameters with our factor analysis model w this psi mu mu not and sigma not and i assume that mu not and sigma not are just zero and identity so we are just left with these three values right now how do we estimate that so you can go back to our original pdf this right so you can max so this is the marginal probability of your data so if i multiply it for all of my training data it will give me a uh, the the likelihood and then you can take a log it will give you log likelihood which is a function of your psi and a function of w and mu and these values i'm fixing them as constant so you can apply a um, maximizing of log likelihood to get these values but it turns out that it will be uh, again a little tricky so what people do is they use em again because again there is some zi and pxi is actually a, is written like this so you can apply em just in the way we applied it for mixture models and get all of these values but we are not going to uh, look at that algorithm here right but the general philosophy is the same you start with some values for your w psi and sigma uh, and mu then you can com compute some kind of a assignment value in the e step and then you maximize it to get the reestimated values for these parameters and keep doing that so that's the general idea any questions so far so what i want to jump to is sort of 
to show how it can be used, right? So that kind of, I think, uh, right. So quickly, let's do that. So here is this data that I pulled up from the internet. It's a data about cars, right? So, so what this data has is information about 387 cars and they have 11 features assigned to them. So these are variable. So these are these different features that we have for this car. So this is our observed data. This is our X, right? So we have things like prices and stuff about the engines and fuel efficiency and so on. So now I'm going to run factor analysis model to this, right? So what I do is here I actually use a factor analysis that's in sklearn because I don't want to do the EM for this one myself. So I say run a factor analysis model on this with two components. So we are assuming that our L is two. That means our latent space is two dimensional. So here again, just like in k-means or in EM, we need to provide what your L is going to be, right? So then I run this factor analysis, I fit my data, and what I get back is W, right? I get my psi, and I also get the Zs, the new Zs that were used, right? So first thing what I want to do is visualize my W matrix. Oh, sorry. So this is how my W matrix looks like. So remember, I had two latent variables, right? First and second. And then each variable here, like horsepower, so horse, so remember these were my 11 variables. Each variable is a combination of these two hidden factors, right? So the first thing you will see is that this gives you a very nice way of interpreting some of these features. So for example, you can see that city MPG and highway MPG are very close to each other in the latent space as well, which makes sense, right? Because we know these features. But think about a domain where we didn't have any clue about what these features mean semantically, right? So then you can use this kind of analysis to understand how they uh, look like. And same thing here, that, okay, all the dimension-related variables are together and so on, right? So that is one way. But this is only showing you the W matrix, which is also important. But now we want to see how do these different objects, these cars, lie in this two-dimensional space. So then we can do the same thing. We do the fit to get our Z's, and then we... So now what I have done is that each point here is a car, which was originally in 11-dimensional space, but now we are mapping it into two-dimensional space. And what this lets you do is see, okay, what sort of, where do each car lie, right? So for example, all of these cars are, think of these as small cars, like Hyundai Accent and Toyota Echo and so on, right? So you can, so this is the first latent factor, and you can think of the first latent factor. This is the first latent factor. This latent factor kind of looks at the size, right? It's very dependent on the size, which means the low values, small values of this latent factor tell you the size aspect of your data. So everything here are small cars. Everything here would be probably big cars. Actually, in this space, sorry. Everything here will be small cars, like Honda Insight and stuff. And here would be your big ones, like Yukon and Hummer and so on, right? And let's look at this latent factor. So what this latent factor tells you, it kind of differentiates your cars in the dimensions of, uh, what is this, price, right? And on this side, the fuel efficiency, right? So if you look at some of these cars over here, these will all be pricey cars, right? And these will all be some of the cheaper cars. So these are the cars that I own. These are cars that I'll never own, right? And then there's a car over here that's very interesting, which is a Porsche 911 GT. So it's very expensive, but it's also, uh, it turns out that it is uh, small. So it's small and expensive, right? Cars over here, there's no car over here, but if there was a very expensive and a very large car, like an Escalade, that's probably going to be here. So this is sort of how we use factor analysis, all right? Any questions? So in next class, what we're going to do is see how factor analysis is actually, or how principal component analysis, which is another technique for dimensionality reduction, 
is a special form of factor analysis. All right, and then we'll move from there to, uh, on some other topics. Okay, there are no other questions. Just one announcement that there are no undergraduate recitations this week. Uh, we'll resume next week, or we'll have the last set next week. Thank you very much.